Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back uh, to the Chronicles of Aguna. Very short, very brief uh, bonus edition of the podcast today uh, because I wanted to jump on and uh, and have a say on the whole Charlie Patino debate that's been going on, of course, over the last sort of 24 hours following David Ornstein's report in which it says that Charlie Patino uh, is looking to leave the club this summer, doesn't want to be uh, a reserve player, doesn't want to go on a short-term loan etc etc and and obviously wants some sort of guarantee around how much football he's going to play I'm paraphrasing but that's basically in a nutshell what the report states what it says and and what it tells us Um, we're also going to touch on the women's UEFA Champions League semi-final uh, defeat last night at Emirates Stadium as well I was there uh, 60,000 crowd incredible scenes brilliant to see Um, obviously though the result was not the one we'd hoped for so we'll do both of those things on this very short bonus edition of the Chronicles of Aguna, of course, coming to you on a match day. Uh, we take on Chelsea at Emirates Stadium this evening. So if you want uh, the full preview show, looking ahead to that game, you can find it. It's the last video on YouTube and it is the last podcast in our feed. So do check that out if you haven't done so already. But let's start off with the Charlie Patino bit because I was really sort of taken aback by the reaction to this news breaking yesterday. Um, I thought that there were... Some people that quite sensibly thought, well, you know, we can't really guarantee this kid first team opportunities straight away, that he's still got a lot to prove, that he's still got a long way to go in terms of proving he can play consistently at the highest level. And that, I think, was kind of where I was at. And then there were others who were outraged, who were suggesting that all the work we've done over the last few years would mean nothing if we were then to allow a talent of Charlie Patino's level to leave the football club. I saw some people comparing him to Cesc Fabregas, Um, you know, and it just, it just came across to me as a bit of an overreaction to some news that doesn't even guarantee that Charlie Patino leaves in the summer. It simply says that he obviously wants some sort of assurances. He wants to know uh, where his path leads as any young talented player should want. You know, I think in the past we've seen a lot of young, talented players who threatened to become the next big thing and then just didn't do that because they made the wrong move or they were working under the wrong manager or they picked up an injury. Like, nothing's a guarantee in football. So when people look at players like Charlie Patino and say he is going to be the next best thing or the next big thing, that's a prediction. It's not fact. Okay, as I said to you, we've seen many players over the years who have threatened to become that and not been able to do it. I don't tend to get as excited as others when it comes to young promising talents. And the reason is because very few of them actually go on to fulfill the potential that maybe we think they have when they're around 17, 18, 19, etc. And I think the way modern football has gone, where clubs are, are so sort of quick to jump into the transfer market, to pluck youngsters away uh, from sort of other European clubs, I think we're in a place where you've got to be pretty outstanding to come through the youth system. And for somebody of 18, 19 years of age, if you're not under consideration at least at that point in your career, although it sounds crazy because it's such a ridiculously young age, there will be a temptation to look elsewhere and there will be a temptation to consider your options. So I understand the player side of this as well. But from what I've seen of Charlie Patino, he looks technically really good, really secure, um, really talented. Physically, I still think he's got a long way to go. I know a lot of people talked about the loan move to the championship and how that was going to be the making of him, essentially. I still look at him even now, pretty much a season down the line, and think that he still needs more of that, that he still needs um, you know, more game time. He still needs more development physically and, and more development in terms of you know, his ability to compete and, and meet the physical standards required in the Premier League. I mean, I watched Arsenal at Manchester City last Wednesday and I thought we lacked power. And I thought that physically, in a lot of areas, they were on another level to us. And so if I say that about this first team, I'd be a hypocrite if I didn't say that Charlie Patino probably needs to bulk up in that sense. He wants to play in the centre of midfield, which is a very physically demanding position. And yeah, we've seen great players sort of mould careers and and build careers off the back of being so technically good and 
so aware and, and so intelligent that maybe their physical attributes that were perhaps lacking proved not to be an issue for them. But you've got to be one hell of a player to be able to overcome that hurdle, not be physically up to the level, but be able to get by based on your technical ability and your in-game intelligence. And looking at Charlie Patino at Blackpool, I think he's done pretty well. I think there have been some real highlights, but I also think there have been games in which he hasn't really been able to get on the ball much. He hasn't really been able to dictate play and he hasn't been able to do the things that we know he's good at. Now, I completely accept that Blackpool were struggling in the championship. I think they're second from bottom at the time of recording. And obviously when you're playing in a poor team in a league where you're being dominated week in, week out, that will have an impact on a player that enjoys getting on the ball that enjoys dictating things um, and enjoys sort of being able to set the rhythm and set the tempo of a football match. But equally, you know, that same that same argument is, is relevant in another way as well because, you know, you're talking about a 19-year-old kid here in Charlie Patino. He's played 33 times, 33 appearances. He's only started 61% of those games. Um, he scored two goals and he's got four assists. Now, if I sort of dive into his performance detail... Um, performance data I beg your pardon in a little bit more detail you know he's been on the bench a few times which suggests that he wasn't uh, you know uh, one of the first names on the team sheet which would concern me because if you're not one of the first names on the team sheet at Blackpool at the bottom of the championship with all due respect how are you someone that is ready or or should be thought of as a as someone that compete for a first that can compete, I beg your pardon, for a first team place at Arsenal. So this is not to, to shit on the guy, right? I, I think he's a real talent. I think he's got a lot going for him. I've I've been excited about him for a little while now, but he's gone out on loan to Blackpool and again I, I'm factoring in the environment in which he's playing and I think more than anything else the experience will be of benefit to him. But I'm finding it hard to make a case that Arsenal should hold on to Charlie Patino at all costs, whether that be financially or whether that be in terms of promises and whether we can make a genuine case, put your emotion to one side, put his likability to one side, put the fact that he's an Arsenal boy to one side. Can you make a genuine case for Arsenal digging their heels in and going above and beyond, as I say, if not financially, in terms of what they promised Charlie Patino in order to keep hold of him. And I can't make that case. So if he wants to stay, great. And if he wants to continue his development at Arsenal Football Club, I'd be more than happy for him to stay. And I would love to, to keep a closer eye on him when he's in and around our club, when we can watch him sort of on a much more uh, regular basis, when we can have a really good close look at him, when we've got the opportunity to analyse his performances that bit more in a team that is competitive, whether that be at, you know, under 21 level whether that be you know in the first team in the cup competitions etc etc but you know to to suggest that he's going to be able to make that jump up from championship to and bottom of the championship to top level of the premier league for me is is a stretch man it is a real real stretch and i can't understand why so many have been so vocal about this and have been so critical of the club who, by the way, haven't even done anything yet. It's not like the club have sort of just banished him. You know, they sent him out on loan to try and develop. And these noises that are coming out with regards to his future, they're coming from his people, you know, and, and it's understood that the club have been quite receptive to what his people are, uh, are proposing, which is a potential move away, which is an opportunity to go and play football regularly or at a higher level. And there will be clubs out there that will take a gamble on him because he does have a huge reputation in terms of, you know, a 19-year-old making his way in the game. He is someone that I think a lot of clubs will go, yeah, you know what, this is worth the risk. This is worth a bit of a financial gamble. But, I mean, at Arsenal this year, we've we've come on leaps and bounds. We've progressed dramatically. We're in a place now where we're challenging for the Premier League title going into the final weeks of the season. We're in the Champions League next season, which is what the goal would have been from the outset. I know I keep saying it, but it's absolutely the truth. And so we want to improve. And that doesn't mean that you move a Xhaka aside or you move a Partey aside. That means you add to that. That means you add better players, players of an equal calibre or above. And Charlie Patino at this stage in his career is not better than Granit Xhaka. He's not better than Thomas Partey. He's not better than Martin Odegaard. 
you can't even say that he's better than Fabio Vieira, who lots of people have, you know, criticised this season and have have labelled as a flop signing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the point I'm trying to make here is that Charlie Patino has a long way to go in terms of proving himself capable of being able to play at this elite level. So if he's demanding guarantees around game time, to me, that's a bit far-fetched. I don't want to lose him. I'd rather keep him. I'd rather we get another season out of him, whether that be on loan, whether that be sort of in and around the first team and we have another look and we have another assessment. But if he is adamant that he wants to go, then I don't think it's crazy for Arsenal to be like, well, okay, let us get the fee then that we think you're worth. I don't think that's a mad decision by any stretch of the imagination. So a lot of the outrage around this for me has been really baffling, really confusing. I, I just can't get my head around it. But hey, um, that's just me. Talented young lad. Hope he stays. I'd love to see him kick on. I'd love to see him push on. There's nothing more satisfying and more enjoyable than watching our own players come through the academy system and make it in the first team. You know, I, I don't know about you guys, but I feel this incredible connection for example, to somebody like Bukayo Saka because of who he is, where he's come from and the route he's done it. And you would feel like that if about Patino if he can make it with a way. But as I say, there have been many before him and there'll be many after him that threaten to get there and threaten to do that, but don't go on um, and achieve that. You need to be lucky as well as talented. You know, you need to have the right pathway. Maybe you need a couple of injuries in the first team to open up the door for you. Maybe you need a coach that believes in you more than most coaches would that there are so many factors that come into play here but if Charlie Patino is adamant that he wants to go and play regular first team football in for example the top flight I don't think there are going to be that many Premier League clubs willing to risk serious money on him and that will be an unpopular opinion I had some replies to my tweet yesterday from Arsenal fans saying you wait and see the clubs that are going to come in for him who what club bigger than Arsenal is going to come in for Charlie Patino. What club on par with Arsenal is going to come in for Charlie Patino based on the evidence they have in front of them right now f from which they can judge how good a player he is or not? Nobody. You're talking bottom end of the Premier League at best. If that, genuinely, and that's not, again, let me reiterate the point. That's not to have a go at the kid or to hammer the kid. But what what is... The sample size, if you're a club looking to invest money on this kid, what is the sample size that you have available to you? You know, you have, what, 33 appearances in the championship. He started 61% of those games. Some of them, some of that is due to injury. I think he missed three games this season through injury. Goals, just a couple. Assists, four. Um, you know, I'm sure there are deeper metrics available uh, to the scouts and to the people that would be making those decisions. And, and they'll go by those as well. But I just don't think we're in a place where we can be critical of the club if they decide, for example, in the summer, our priority is to go get a Caicedo or a Rice to build on our midfield. And it isn't making room for someone that is still on that pathway. I think that's a perfectly fair stance to have. Um, you know, if he goes on to have a wonderful career, maybe people will look back on it and say it was a mistake. But hindsight is a wonderful thing and it's easy to do those things with hindsight, isn't it? So at this moment in time, I think based on the evidence we have, I think if Arsenal are supportive of a Patino move, if that is indeed what he wants, then I don't think there's really anything wrong with that. Um, but that's just my take. Look, don't forget to uh, leave a like on the video if you haven't done so already. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Uh, really, really appreciate it. Remember, we've got content coming your way uh, over the next couple of days uh, with regards to the Chelsea game. Uh, and then, of course, we'll be building up for that trip to Newcastle at the weekend, which is another big one for Mikel Arteta's side. That is going to be a difficult game. I think tonight's going to be a difficult game as well. But hey, um, we'll, we'll save that for another show. Um, just wanted to touch on as well, uh, obviously, the UEFA Women's Champions League semi-final. Arsenal beaten in the end uh, on aggregate by Wolfsburg. It went all the way to extra time. Uh, it was a wonderful occasion. Sold out Emirates Stadium. I, I thought the atmosphere was fantastic. I saw Tim Stillman posted a tweet earlier where he said, you know, in the past when there have been big crowds at women's games, it's felt like an audience rather than support. But yesterday it felt like support. And, and I really did feel that being in the stadium. I thought, um, you know, everybody in attendance was right behind the team, helping them through difficult moments. I mean, how bad is this team's luck when it comes to injuries and ACL injuries in particular? Another one last night. It's just, it's heartbreaking. And to lose the game in the way that the Arsenal did, I think, was was a really difficult one to take, particularly for those 
that have followed uh, the Arsenal women's side on their journey in this competition so far. I mean, look, I'll be honest with you, I'm not, um, I'm not across the women's game as much as I should be, and you know that is on me to improve on that. It's more because. Um, you know, it's more because I don't have the time than because I don't respect it or don't, um, you know, relate to it in any way. I think that if you, all you have to do is kind of stand back and look at the growth of it. And if you look at the growth, you look at the fact that Arsenal have sold out a stadium last night with 60,000 supporters. Um, just tells you where it's gone and, and where it's going because that would never have been the case, you know, four or five years ago. What I will say is the crowd is very different at a women's game certainly more families um the atmosphere is certainly more supportive than it is hostile as it you know it can get a bit like that in the men's games um you know there's not as much anger spilling over it's just very very different and it's a nice place to be sometimes um you know and and sort of for me i, I went with my wife last night and uh we were sitting there and, and my wife was like she she doesn't go to many games she's been to a handful with me but they've never been games of any real significance I tend to leave her at home for the ones where I know I'm going to be on edge um but she's she said to me look even I noticed that the atmosphere here is different tonight and that's not a bad thing it's just a different thing and, and I think one of the big barriers that people have maybe with the women's game when sort of trying to get into it or trying to kind of you know start following it a little bit long is is that they compare it to the men's game you know there's a lot of things that are very very different the pace of the game I think is different I think um, some of the key factors in the outcomes of in deciding the outcomes of games are very, very different. The atmosphere is very, very different. Um, the, the players are very, very different in their characters. I think they're much more um, connected to the supporters that do go along and watch. Um, and so, yeah, there are there are good sides to it for sure, and and maybe there are some sides that need improving still as well. But the game is still very much in its infancy in comparison to the men's one, which is obviously a lot further along and has a lot more investment behind it and it's you know when there's that investment over a longer period of time you get more experts there's more expertise and yeah it just it, you know women's football is on the rise it really really is and I'm proud of my club because Arsenal have always been at the forefront of the women's game and always been developing uh, women's teams to a much higher standard than most clubs out there you still get the feeling that there are football clubs out there that don't care about it and don't give it the love and attention that it deserves, whereas Arsenal certainly cannot be accused um, of that. Heartbreaking in the end, Wubber Moyes' mistake uh, at the back allowed the Wolfsburg in for the winner, and it was, what, two, three minutes before the end of extra time. Real, real heartbreak. I think for me, I, I know the players were tired. I know they were dead on their feet. I know that Arsenal have had so many injuries, and I know that Jonas Adevel had to put square pegs in round holes in order to get through the rest of that game. And you could see that their effort was appreciated by those in attendance, by the manager, by the captain, Katie McCabe, etc., etc. But I, I just thought the mistake was so basic. And, uh, and and I just thought it was so... <laughs> it was such a disappointing way to end the Champions League campaign. Now, you could argue that whoever goes to the final is going to be trounced on by Barcelona anyway. But I just thought Wobber Moy's decision to take the player on on the inside so she was she had the ball at sort of right center back for those that haven't seen it and uh, what she attempted to do was take on the player that was pressing her and rather than sort of trying to take her on on the outside which meant that if she did lose possession she'd probably still be on the right side to defend the situation at least make it difficult to get the cross in and buy her teammates some time to get set in the middle what she did was try to take the player on on the inside. And when you lose the ball there, you're on the wrong side automatically and you're, um, you're facing an uphill battle. So, yeah, it was just so basic. And, and that obviously leaves a sour taste, you know. And But that that's the difference, again, and that's another difference between women's and men's football because the reaction to that mistake has been not positive. You can't have a positive reaction to a big mistake, but it's been supportive. Whereas in the men's game, whoever makes that decision, whoever does that, will be vilified. And so that's another real, real difference I see between the two games. But just, you know, I'm not going to go into the tactics of it. I'm not going to analyse it on a super deep level because there are better people out there to do that than me. There are people out there that follow the women's team very, very closely. I highly recommend Tim Stillman's content. I think he's fantastic. Um, so do check that out. But 
I mean, for me, it was more about the occasion than anything else. It was more about the fact that 60,000 people had turned up to watch this. It was more about the feel-good factor around Arsenal Football Club at this moment in time. FA Youth Cup final last week. Obviously, Arsenal lost. Not great. The performance wasn't great. The outcome certainly wasn't. But to be there, to have the the occasion at Emirates Stadium and to have as many supporters in attendance as we did was a, a credit to the club. To then have... Uh, the men's team pushing really hard in the Premier League, trying to win the title is obviously an indication of how well they've done and how much they've developed. And then to have the women's team, albeit having been eliminated, but having reached the semi-final of the Champions League is is a positive as well. So might have been a, a difficult week so far. Arsenal losing at City, the Youth Cup final, obviously ending in a victory for West Ham and what happened last night. Hopefully that bad week is put to an end tonight when we take on Chelsea at Emirates Stadium. But with the bad week comes a lot of pride as well because of where Arsenal Football Club are at, the state of it, not just in the men's team, not just in the first team, but across the age groups and of course uh, into the women's game as well. So lots to be proud of as an Arsenal fan. Fingers crossed we can go to Emirates Stadium tonight, get back to winning ways in the Premier League and uh, at least be there and ready and waiting just in case Manchester City drop some points in the run-in. Uh, thank you all so much for tuning in. Subscribe, like, share. You know the draw by now. Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Uh, let me know your thoughts on Patino. I'm interested to gauge how you guys are feeling about that one. And I'll see you all soon. Cheers.